I'm doing the intro. I'm doing the intro. I was gonna try. What's up, fam? Welcome back to the Well That's Good podcast. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Today is one of everyone's favorite days. We're gonna answer DMs. I thought you were gonna say it was because I was on. Oh, well, yeah, and because Christian's on. Which Thank you. I appreciate it. No one is more confident about Christian's appearances on this podcast than Christian himself. Hey, I see the ratings. <laughs> Okay. When you can see the analytics sheet, you get you get a little giddy. <laughs> Someone humble him. I'm just kidding. He is I'm humble. Just kidding. He's a humble giant, and he's just walking in that confidence, you know. But anyways, we do love doing this, and it's so fun to answer y'all's questions. Um, it is one of the most listened to podcast series that we have, um, yeah. and that is because they're questions that y'all ask, and they're really good questions. And we really do try to be intentional about these questions that y'all ask. Um, it means a lot that you would even reach out and trust us with the questions that are a little bit bigger um, that you're leaning in for advice in. So I'm going to tell you the questions that we have chosen for today, some of the DMs we're going to answer, and just so y'all can know kind of the direction we're going, because it's kind of all over the place, but I thought these were really good. Also, this is just a friendly reminder. We really love getting y'all's DMs, y'all mm-hmm. asking questions, you telling us who you want to have on the podcast, what you would like to see us talk about, questions that you have in your spiritual life, personal life, whatever it is. Um We love that, and we really do see it. We listen to it, and we take note of it whenever we're planning the podcast. So thank y'all for that. Um, So a couple questions we're going to be going over today is, number one, what is the difference between a spiritual high and a spiritual encounter? Is one more important than the other? Um, Another question is, how do you avoid gossip and kindly remove yourself from these kind of conversations? How do you learn to be more disciplined, and how do you keep laziness out of your life? How do you find peace in a world full of demands, deadlines, and expectations while also feeling stress and anxiety? I read scripture and talk about it, but I still find myself struggling. How have you seen God remain true to his promises time and time again? And how do you combat the loneliness that comes with being a new mom? So we're going to dive into each of these questions. And yeah, again, a lot of different directions, but I feel like these are just incredible questions that, you know, we've maybe struggle with some of these, maybe found some truth in some of these, learned a lot from different mentors and friends, and we're going to give you all the advice that we have to give. Um, So Christian, let's tackle the first one first. What is the difference between a spiritual high and a spiritual encounter? Is one more important than the other? And um, I will say this question was actually on Spotify. Someone, because you can comment questions on Spotify when you're listening to the podcast. And I wonder if this person is asking that question because sometimes I'll say that. I'll say, oh, it wasn't just a spiritual high. It was a spiritual encounter. And I'll go first from what I mean by that. And then I would love to hear what you have to say because I feel like you've you've really lived lived that in Mm -hmm. high school. Um, But I would say spiritual highs are those classic things that you talk about after like youth conferences or events where you go to a camp or you go to a conference and it's like, oh, I'm on fire for God. But, you know, it's just a high, you know, it's going to dwindle, you know, it's not really going to last. But you were really excited about it at the time. It's kind of like a fire that flames really bright, but it's really easy to put out. Um, And I would say a spiritual encounter is different than that. It's not about the hype. It's not really a high. It's a true um, encounter with God that really changes everything. It's you you no longer can be the same. It, It makes me think of when Moses was in the wilderness on the mountain and a fire, you know, was burning, but uh, or a bush was on fire, but it wasn't burning. And the Lord encountered Moses. He called him by name. And after that encounter with the Lord, uh, Moses was never the same. That wasn't just a spiritual high that encouraged Moses. It wasn't just a moment that it was like, that was awesome, or it was hype. It changed everything about mm-hmm. Moses's life. And he was about to step into something with God, um, or I guess step into doing life totally with God. And so I think when you have a spiritual high, it can be fleeting. But when you have a spiritual encounter, it changes everything about who you are. And you walk away from that with God and uh, you don't look back on that. So if you're going to say is one more important than the other, uh, I think the answer is obvious if you look at it like that, that an encounter is so important. And a high is it's good to fan the flame of your spiritual life, but if it didn't really change you and it's not sustainable it doesn't or it doesn't sustain you, then maybe you just had a high and you didn't really have an encounter. Yeah, that's good. I would kind of break it down. You know, I think a spiritual high is more of a feeling and a spiritual encounter is more like a marking. But both require 
something after it, right? A spiritual high, like you said, it's fanning the flame. And a spiritual encounter, you're still, you know, you're still doing things after you have that encounter, right? And I think that, you know, like you said, with youth camps and with conferences and with events and different things, I think, I think you can, I think you do get spiritualized and I think, you know, they dwindle in a way, but I think you can always look back and tell the difference between, at least in my life, a spiritual high versus a spiritual encounter. And every time a spiritual high, it didn't last long. It's, you know, we always talk about Mark four, Ben Stewart preached on that passion, like the, the soils and they're. I can look back in my life to where I can say, oh, that was a spiritual high. And I can look back and I can see where this was a spiritual encounter. And I can see because there was a difference after it. There was mm-hmm. fruit that was born. There was conviction that happened. And change. Yeah, there, there was a, it was a true marking versus just a feeling that I had, that I had had. So if whoever asked that question or if you've, you know, heard that language throughout you know, church or whatever, I would just argue that a spiritual high is, it's a feeling and it could be, and it could it, be it, good. It can be a like, great it can thing. be great. It's uh, spiritual highs are not a bad thing, but they're bad when you, when there's nothing sustainable underneath them. Like I would say for me, like at camps and conferences, I've also had encounters at those things. So those things are not bad. They're great. The high that you get from it is great. Like passion each year. I've had encounters at passion, but I also have spiritual highs from passion conference where I leave a conference with 60,000 people worshiping God and I'm encouraged and I'm strengthened. And that's a high, like I, there's a, like, you know, that's a highlight of the year. That's Mm -hmm. not what the whole year is going to look like. And so I think like, it's a good thing, but if I'm dependent on those high moments to sustain my Christianity, Mm -hmm. then I have not had an encounter with God. That's really changed me. Yeah, that's good. Well, I think it's, I think in the moment, you can't really distinguish between what it is. But I think when you look back at your life, the, you fruit. Can, the fruit, you can tell. So if you're at a camp or a conference or whatever, and you leave, you know, it could be a spiritual high or it could, it could truly be an encounter. And I think it's hard to distinguish the two in the moment. Mm-hmm. I think it's six months later or months later or mm-hmm. a year later, you can look back and say, okay, no, that wasn't just a high. That was a true encounter because it radically changed. Yeah. Everything by the way that I was living. It's good. So it's one more important than the other. I would say a spiritual encounter, just because typically when you encounter something, there's a it's a different shift than mm-hmm. versus just a high a that high you get from yep. from an event like that. Yep. As maybe it would be like in in a good analogy way to put it, it's like there's a difference in going to a Taylor Swift conference and, or a concert. So say I'm going to a Taylor Swift concert and I experience the concert. That is a high. I'm like, woo, I was at a Taylor Swift concert. It was awesome. It was so fun. And then over time, like, you know, I get further away from the concert and I love listening to the music and it's good, but like the highs dwindled, you know, I'm, I'm on to my life. Versus I went to a Taylor Swift concert. I met Taylor Swift. We became friends. We encountered each other. We got each other's number. And now from this point on, T Swift is my friend. I can call her up. We can talk. We can have. So that's kind of a good way to look at a difference in like a high from an experience and a relationship form from an encounter. Um, and so I just thought about that. That's maybe like a way that you can. Yeah, good little nugget. Yeah, a good little, good little nugget. nugget. Okay. How do you avoid gossip and kindly remove yourself from those conversations? Um, I love this question mainly because one, you're looking to avoid it because I think one, you have to realize that gossip is a sin and it is a problem. And I think because gossip is something that is so common and so casually done, um, sometimes we don't think about the weightiness of it and the effects that it really has, but gossip can be detrimental, you know? And so one, I love that you even are seeking to change. Two, I love that you said kindly remove yourself from it because I do think that there is a way to remove yourself kindly and it doesn't have to be like this big. It doesn't need to shame anyone else, you know, in the room when you remove yourself from a conversation like that. Um, I think that you're really good at this. I've seen you walk away from conversations of gossip or shut them down. And I think that that takes a lot of confidence to do. Um, And then also I think, but I think one way of like just avoiding it is just being sensitive to it and like allowing your sensitivity and your conviction of it, like give you the confidence to actually speak up.
Y'all, it is so fun to watch Haven grow stronger and stronger day by day, and so fun to see her just trying new things and loving new foods. But of course, we are still on that bottle life, and A2 Platinum is an infant formula whose number one ingredient is fresh, pure A2 milk from cows that naturally produce the A2 protein and aren't treated with the growth hormone RBST. It's formulated for little tummies as they grow and develop, and it's nutritionally complete with essential ingredients like DHA, vitamin E, probiotics and choline. Y'all know I'm about quality, especially when it comes to products for the girls. And at A2, quality and safety are the top priorities. They received the Clean Label Projects Purity Award and have a flawless record of zero recalls, which honestly is awesome. Um, We had a great experience when we first tried A2 Platinum. I was a little worried because, you know, if you're a mom and you've given your baby one type of formula, it can be a little bit nerve-wracking to try a new one. Is it going to mess with their tummy? How is she going to handle it? But when I tell you, that little girl sucked it down. She loved it. She um, had a great, like, it was like as if I didn't change anything, and she responded so great to it, which was awesome because I knew, one, she loves it, and I'm giving her a great product. So join me and the parents around the world that choose A2 Platinum for their little ones. So pick up A2 Platinum Infant Formula at your local Meyer or Wegmans store or have it delivered directly to your door by visiting a2platinum.com slash whoa. I got it delivered at my house because we don't have those local grocery stores like that, but it was super easy process. So right now, when you order online with my special URL code, you'll get 25% off your first purchase. This is an amazing deal. So don't wait to get 25% off your first order. Go to the letter A and the number two, platinum.com slash w-h-o-a that's a2platinum.com slash whoa even like earlier um we were having a conversation with a group of friends and these are like some of our very best friends so we're just talking and when you're talking to your best friends you might be a little bit more loose with your words and uh someone accidentally said something along the lines of (laughs) I was trying not to do it. You under the bus. I said someone, but I knew you were going to laugh when I said it. You accidentally said, he didn't mean to, but he accidentally said, um, like this, like a person was stupid. He's like, well, that, I, you're just stupid if you think that. And then I was like, was I just, I know, it was statement. a generic. And then I was just like, hey, like, let's not say that they're stupid because we don't understand where they're coming from. And, and then Christian was like, oh, yeah, I didn't actually mean to like call the person stupid. I meant to say, like, that's a, that's not like they're thinking about it in a, a wrong way. way. It was a dumb way to think about a, a scenario. And I think that's like a good example of just being sensitive to people that aren't in the room and being sensitive that we're not gossiping. And because we're talking to our friends, I didn't want them to think, because I knew Christian's heart, that he was calling this person stupid when I knew he really just meant that what that person did was a stupid way of going about it. So you might be listening to this and you're like, that's so small. Like I call people stupid all the time or whatever it is. And that's not necessarily bad or sin or whatever. You might be like thinking this is way too strict. But I think just like your sensitivity towards the way you speak about people that, you know, your tongue holds a lot of power. It holds the power of life and death. And the way we speak about people, it matters. And because I know Christian's heart and I knew the person he was talking about and we actually do love that person, I didn't want him to accidentally paint that person in a light that we didn't even think about. And so Mm -hmm. anyways, as I just say, like a lot of it is sensitivity and a lot of it is just like calling yourself out, calling each other out. I have to call myself out. Sometimes I'll say stuff and I'll be like, that was actually just like a dumb thing to say that's not even true or whatever. I I said something to my sister the other day about a situation and it was just assuming. And then I said, actually, like I'm totally assuming and that's not even true. So just throw that out. And so I think being able to correct yourself and having the humility to say when you're wrong, to admit when you were gossiping, to admit whenever you uh, said something that actually wasn't right. Because we do that all the time. We actually say something and then we're like, That wasn't even true. But a lot of times we don't take that next step to be like, hey, actually, I take that back. Forget that. That was dumb or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whenever I think of just removing yourself, I think about that meme where the dude's holding up like the peace sign and he slowly just like fizzles out of the frame. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think I, I love what you said about, you know, the sensitivities because I think for a lot of people... Well, yes, gossip is a sin, but I do think that there you have to for you distinguish the difference between gossip and slander. I I think those are the I think those are two different ways you go about it, mm-hmm. right? I think if it's just gossip, I think you know you can kindly remove yourself. 
multiple different ways. Like, and th- this might even be good advice, but I mean, faking a phone call and like leaving the conversation or like just, you know, slowly start taking steps back and then go to another, like, so there's peace sign. And, yeah, there's, and well, there's things like that, but <clears throat> you know, if it's, how do you avoid slander and kindly move your stuff? I think, you know, that's maybe when you could speak up. What and, is the difference between gossip and slander? Well, gossip could just be like, you know, talking about a person, but not in like a, not in like a, like a harmful way of like, you know, I think, I mean, I don't really know. I think we should look at the definition. Okay. Let's look at the definition. Let's pull it up. Let's pull it up because we want to give people the best piece of advice. And I will say too, like removing yourself. Is your phone dead? No, oh. it was just the brightness is way down. Removing yourself from a situation. I think on one hand, yes, you can just walk away. You can fake a phone call. But if it's your friends in the room and it's genuine people who love you and you have a relationship with, I would actually encourage you not to just remove yourself, but actually like speak into it and say like, hey, Actually, I don't think we should be talking about this because either one, it's not true or because I don't think it's really fair to speak about them in that way behind their back or, hey, I just feel convicted about this because I don't think that this is a great conversation and uplifting anyone. And I know I've contributed to it as well. And so I'm the first one to say I'm sorry for starting the conversation or being, you know, stoking it or whatever it is. And so... I think like, yes, you can remove yourself, but there is also something too. If you have a relationship with the people, hold the whole room accountable and you don't have to be weird about it. You don't have to be shameful. You can just be like, y'all, I am just going to be honest. We are totally talking smack. (laughs) That's true. Okay. So the definition of gossip, noun, casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people, typically involving details that are not confirmed, not details that are not, not confirmed as being true. Slander, making false or damaging statements about someone. So, I mean, both bad. I was just meaning like, you know, if someone is saying something that you know is not true and they're trying to like, you know, get somebody to turn their back on somebody or like actually to paint somebody. Just to create drama. Just to create drama. Then I think, you know, you can stand up and say, hey, like. That's not true. That's, like, that's actually not true. So, like, let's get the truth right first, you know? I mean, I mean, all that to say, how do you avoid gossip and kind of, kind of remove yourself? I think, yes, standing up to it. And I think, you know, disengaging yourself from the conversation, but also having the sensitivity to to address it and just to say, hey, you know, like, and not in the standpoint of like, hey, do you know that gossiping is a sin no, and we shouldn't do that's it? that's what I'm saying. Don't be weird. Like, Don't be Just rude. say, like, hey, we shouldn't talk about I feel Katie bad like about that. this. Or yeah. like, you know, like, let's not. We don't know her we, we, heart. We don't know her heart behind that. Like, let's not assume things, you know. So I think that's the way. But And I love whenever Julie Chen Moonves was on this podcast and she was like, I didn't even know gossip was a sin until I was in my 40s. And my whole life was re- revolved around gossip. And so if you're sitting here and you're like, I didn't even know it was a sin. I talk smack about people all the time. I always say things about people that probably aren't true or assume things. And that's just like a natural part of your conversation or that's the way that your friends talk. Um, I would say, one, like, hey, you don't know what you don't know. But two, now that you do know, you're, you know, responsible for what you know. And you have to um, take accountability to yourself. And it's just, you know, start making small changes. Stop, Mm -hmm. Stop talking about people. Start removing yourself. Start standing up in rooms that, you know, people are being spoke about behind their back and people are assuming things and we are so um drawn to drama just as humans mm-hmm. you know we want to talk about it just because it's fun to talk about just because but i think gossip is such a cheap way to speak you know there's so many more fruitful conversations you're talking about things you don't even know you're assuming things it's a what if like you can talk about so many other things that have um impact or that are fun or that are funny that don't bring someone else down so mm-hmm. anyways is and gossip, if gossip is-, is your main form of humor Get a new form of humor. Or entertainment. Get or a new form of entertainment because it's just not even cool. And so, yes, gossip is a sin. Slander is a sin. Remove yourself, but don't just remove yourself. Speak up into it and start to change. But don't be weird about it. Be kind about it. All that to say. Okay. How do you learn to be more disciplined and how to keep laziness out of your life? So I'm going to ask Christian this question because I cannot, I am not as good about this. I I love a good nap. That doesn't mean I'm lazy. Some of the smartest people in the world take naps, right? But there are times where I'm like, okay, I need to get up my butt and I need to, you know, actually go work out or do something. And 
I mean, I say that and I'm extremely busy, so I'm not ignoring the fact that I am busy and I'm not lazy. But there have been times in my life where I think it's hard to be disciplined, especially when it comes to like physical things, because I'm like, oh, I'm so busy. I'd rather just lay here for an hour and do nothing Mm -hmm. and just like whatever. But I feel like you're really good at continuing to be disciplined even when you're tired. So how do you get to that level? (laughs) That is good. Well, I think, you know, when it comes to discipline and laziness, I think that, you know, I think throughout this podcast, we already talked about how everyone has different, you know, different frames of certain things, right? So like what I would view as discipline to me would not be necessarily maybe discipline to you. Mm -hmm. And like what I would say is lazy maybe you would not describe it as lazy, Mm -hmm. right? Like sometimes I think taking a nap can be lazy, but you're like, no, I don't think it's lazy. Like I think it's- It's rejuvenating. It's rejuvenating (laughs) or whatever. Or like, you know, to me, discipline might be waking up at whatever time and then getting a workout in. But discipline to somebody else might mean, no, to be disciplined, you got to wake up at 5 a.m. and have a quiet time. Like, so there's- Yeah. So I think you got to like figure out- what you describe as being disciplined and what you describe as being lazy. What you commit to. Like what you commit to. So I'm saying if you're disciplined to do X, Y, and Z, and then you don't do it, then you kind of can say, okay, well, I was being lazy here and here. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have, you know, it's almost like what Craig Rochelle said about, um, you know, almost like setting a thing. Mm -hmm. What what, What's the thing that you've been talking about? Pre-deciding. Yeah, like pre-deciding, like. So if you pre-decide to be disciplined in this area and you're not and you're not, then you can say then you're lazy. Then you're lazy. <laughs> yeah. Right? But if you don't pre-decide to be disciplined in these areas, then it's kind of hard to say, well, like for instance, we have not been waking up early just because we've not been we've not been sleeping just because of having two kids, it's been difficult to be sleep like to get to to get sleep. So I could say, you know, if I want to wake up at 6 a.m. this whole week because I want to read the Bible or worship or go work out or whatever. And if I, if I set that discipline, but I don't do it, then I can say, okay, well then it, for me, I would say I was being lazy in this area. But if I didn't set that principle, then I couldn't say, well, I was mm-hmm. being lazy because I didn't have, I didn't almost like pre-decide it. So I think yeah. for you, you know, you have to just decide what you want to be disciplined in. It can be starting a Bible reading plan. It can be listening to worship music. It can be, you know, not doing whatever. So mm-hmm. it's almost like I'm kind of rambling. No, what you said, you can even stop there because what you said was really good and actually a really good piece of advice um, to each their own, right? But for you, I do encourage you like set things that you're going to commit to because some of you might hear that and go like, all right, sweet. I'm not being lazy because I'm not being disciplined in any area of my life. Mm-hmm. And I don't even want to make commitments because then I might fail. It's like, no, like, Make commitments, do hard things, set your mind to something great, be better next year than you are this year, be better tomorrow than you are today, set goals for sure. And yeah, you might mess up some days. Yeah, you might oversleep, but that's okay. Don't shame yourself. Get back up the next day, but like do something and be disciplined in some area. And for me right now, um, it, it does look like trying to get up before the kids get up to read and to have a quiet time. And I'm not perfect at it. And some mornings I am lazy, but when I do, I'm like, man, I'm so glad I did this and stuck to what I set out to do because it's so fruitful. Like this morning, mm-hmm. I was able to have such a good quiet time and I, I needed that. It was so great to start my day off. And so, yeah, set goals, try to do better, try to be disciplined. Um, and then, yeah, you can gauge your laziness by how committed you are to what you set. Um, good, great question. Friends, let's be real. Taking care of your health is not always easy, but it should be at least simple. And that's why for the last several years, as you know, we have been drinking AG1. It's just one scoop mixed in with ice water, how I like it, once a day, every day, and it makes you feel so great, so focused, so energized, ready to take on the day, and just knowing that you did something great for your body. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers your daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's always 
super simple, and that is what I love about it. AG1 is so simple, it fits right into our schedule since it's just one scoop into some cold water. And if you're on the go, you can grab a travel pack with you. That's what we do. The travel packs just fit literally in your purse, in your backpack, whatever you have. It's so easy. Just pour one of those packs into some water, even a water bottle if that's what you have. It is a game changer, especially on a busy day or busy season of your life, um, especially even traveling. Like traveling is so hard to stay healthy, but this is a great way to stay healthy no matter where you're going. This is great because it really covers all the bases from support for your brain, your gut, your immune health, um, because AG1 is so packed with so many vitamins, probiotics, and nutrients. We decided to try AG1 because it seemed like a really simple way to stay really healthy, and Christian tried it first. I was a little hesitant. I was like, that looks very green, and no. But then when I tried it, I was like, what? It actually tastes really good, and it makes me feel great. I, I literally noticed a difference day one. Y'all know I love a good quality product, and AG1's ingredients are sourced for quality and potency, and every batch goes through tons of testing to make sure it's exactly what your body needs. If there's one product that I would recommend for your health and to elevate your health, that would be AG1, and that's why we've been partners for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. So try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash woe. Again, that's drinkag1.com slash woe to check it out today. Well, I think sometimes we view dis like it's like a New Year's resolution, right? It's like I'm gonna do this, and then it might like fizzle out. But disciplines are so much more broader than just setting one specific goal, mm-hmm. right? It's like how you structure your life. So I think you know, not 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 to beat a dead horse because we need to get on to the next question. But I think to each your own, like you said, create look at your life and create certain disciplines that you want to try to work towards. And if you feel like mm-hmm. you're getting out of a rhythm of that, then I think that's how you could, you know, assess that you are being lazy in this area. Yep. And that's actually what I said to start. I was like, you know what? I haven't been, you know, as good at working out and all these things, but I'm like, but I'm not lazy. And so I was kind of establishing at the beginning, I might not be disciplined in that area, but that doesn't mean I'm lazy, but mm-hmm. that's not something I really set out to do right now. So that was a good way to put it. Okay, next question. This one is for real, getting me right now, but it says, how do you find peace in a world full of demands, deadlines, and expectations while also feeling stress and anxiety? I read scripture and talk about it, but I still find myself struggling. Friend, that is tough. I mean, this is something that I think will forever be um, a wrestle, and I think it's something that Not that you can't overcome it, for sure you can overcome it, but I think it's a day-by-day overcoming. It's day-by-day receiving His mercy, day-by-day receiving His truth. Um, I'll tell you what, for me lately, what's been good for me, so I have been feeling really anxious lately because I have so much on the calendar, so much on my plate, and I look at it and I'm like, (gasps) so deadlines, expectations, things I need to do, and it makes me super stressed and super anxious, and um I don't want to live that way because the last thing I need to do is show up to each day anxious. And the last thing I need to do is show up to the day stressed out because, hey, I got a lot to do and I want to do it well. I want to be the best mom I can be. I want to be the best wife I can be. I want to be the best leader I can be. And the best of me is not anxious me. So I've got to figure out this anxiety thing. And so one thing that's been helping me is um, I tell Christian all the time, I'm like, man, I could have been a great lawyer because I will build cases in my mind all the time. And what I do is I almost like, build these cases for anxiety. And I'm like, okay, I have this, I have this, I have this, this happened, that happened, this happened four months ago. And I'm like, I'm like bringing back all the past and all the present. And I'm like, and then present it to Christian. Here's why I'm so overwhelmed. Here's why I'm so stressed. This, 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 this is like all my reasons to almost like affirm why I would be so anxious. And I was actually talking to my counselor the other day and I didn't tell her that analogy. I didn't tell her that I view myself as such a good lawyer and that I, you know, make my case studies for anxiety unintentionally. It's just how my brain works. I didn't tell her any of that. Um, I was just talking to her through just all these stresses and all these anxieties and my calendar and whatnot. And at the end of it, it was so cool because she starts speaking truth over me and she starts bringing up things that I even said in the conversation that were truth filled. And she said, Sadie, we are just building your case right now. We're building your case for truth. And I just love that because I was like, wow. I build cases in my mind all day for anxiety, but what if instead of building my case for anxiety, I built my case for truth? 
I mean, that's so powerful because that mm-hmm. would dominate my anxiety because my case for truth ends in a period. My case for anxiety ends in a what if dot, dot, dot. But how cool would it be if instead of like ending it in this dot, 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 anxious what if state and all the things that happen, I end it with like, here's who I am. Here's who I am in Christ. Here's what God has done. Here's what the word says about me. That is just like statement. That is truth. That is um that is done. And so I just realized that is such a better way to live. And so this morning, actually, real time, woke up and I wrote down my case for truth. I literally read Psalm 91. I read Ephesians 6. I uh, wrote the verse down about how God did not give me a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. I said, these are all things that God says are true, um, that, you know, I will find um, refuge in Him, safety in Him, that He has me. I don't have to fear that I have a sound mind. This is the armor of God that I've been given. And I wrote it personally. I'm putting this on. This is the weapon I have to fight with, the word of God and prayer at all times. Like this is true about me. And then I wrote down other truths about me that I am in Christ and that people have spoken over me and all these different things. And I just literally looked at it and I wrote at the top, this is true and read it and started my day based in truth. And Christian knows me. Um, he's he's known where I've been in life. And I'm so much more free today, so much more joyful today, um, excited about life. And so that doesn't take away all the things on my calendar. That mm-hmm. doesn't take away all the things that mm-hmm. stress me out, but it does take away my stress because I, it's overrided with what's true. It's overrided with who God is. And um, mm-hmm. it's one thing to just, you know, read truth and kind of just read over it. It's another thing to meditate on it and claim it and speak it over you and identify with it and read it out loud and write it down and really walk in it. And today I needed to do that. And so maybe for you, um, you have a lot of deadlines, you have a lot of things in your calendar, you have a lot of reasons to be afraid, you have a good case for anxiety, but write yourself a better case for truth. And I promise you, it will be better because God wrote it and you get to identify with that and that's what i'm doing today it's helped me a lot that's so good great answer thanks boo well i have a few things to add um you know so just the first the first few things of the question how do you find peace you know the super generic answer you know peace is only found in god right if you look at galatians 5 peace is the fruit of the spirit love joy peace um so there's a thing that you can exemplify by being you know, in Christ and his peace, which really just means, you know, circumstantially, you know, you have, there's something greater in you than, than whatever is in the world. Um, and I think, you know, if you go to the back half, while also feeling stress and anxiety, there are also practical things that I feel like all these questions, I just keep thinking like really, it really is to each your own. Like if you want to find peace and you're feeling stress and anxiety, like there are things that you may not may not do right so like you've deleted social media like there's so um sorry i will say i have kind of thrown me off well i love each other i've deleted social media i have talked to a counselor i have talked to two Mm -hmm. mentors i have talked to you i have like i do not get passive with anxiety i do not get passive with struggling with that i'm like "Uh uh-uh nope i have a sound mind i am not gonna sit here and try to go about my life while I'm being super mm-hmm. anxious and overwhelmed by stress. Because like I said, I got to show up. Like I got to I gotta host this podcast. I got to be a good wife. I got to be yeah. a good mom. And so like, I'm not just going to sit here and let my mind be riddled with anxiety. I got to speak truth over myself. I got to get out whatever is making me anxious. I got to talk to someone because I'm just not going to do it. And so I think you got to get serious about it too. Don't just be like, oh, I have so much anxiety. Like yeah. work through it. Yeah. So, yeah. so how do you find peace? Scripture, prayer, worship, back half. While also feeling stress, anxiety, cutting out the things that you know, you know, feed that. Like last year, I had to just delete all the news from my phone. I kept getting just these reports and and these different things, and it was making me super anxious. So I was like, there's a way on the iPhone that you can just cancel the news app to where you don't get any updates or when you swipe left, there's no, you know, new articles or whatever. So I had to cut that out. It might be a TV show for you. It may be social media. So how do you find peace, scripture, prayer, God? All, obviously, all the things Mm -hmm. that that, that comes with that. And then, you know, while also feeling stress, anxiety, you have to just look at your life and 
for you, it may be that TV show. It may not be that TV show. It may be Mm -hmm. the news. It might not be the news. It might be social media. It might not be social media, Mm -hmm. right? So you have to just assess for you what you feel like those trigger points are and cut that out. Mm -hmm. And I would just say you will find peace a lot easier if you assess what is making you feel anxious, what is making you feel stressed, and cut that out. And I think that you will find peace a lot quicker, obviously, in the same spot that you'll find it. Um, even if you don't, it's going to be found in God. Yeah. But I just encourage you to look at your life and delete what needs to be deleted and just yeah. to cut off what needs to be cut off. And not all stress and anxiety is a bad thing, too. You have to realize that. Like, mm-hmm. some anxiety is good. You should feel a little anxiety so that, you know, you protect yourself. I mean, um, Dr. Amon's been on this podcast a couple of times, and, and he says people die because they don't have anxiety because they don't think this is a bad idea. I should not do this. And so some anxiety is good. Some stress is natural. I mean, if you have a ton on your plate, you're going to feel a little stress but what that stress and anxiety can do is it can either either like overcome you and that's bad and wrong and you can't operate like that or it can cause you to be dependent on the lord and lean into him and use wisdom and use discernment and allow his spirit to speak um through you and in you and um you know, it can cause you to lean in or just be overcome. And so lean into it, you know, you can have peace and still have the awareness that something is scary or the awareness that something is stressful, but still be in complete peace. So your question was structured really well. And that was, that was a great question. Thanks for asking it. Y'all, we are very aware of the struggle of getting little ones to go to bed. It is very, very hard, but let me tell you what was a game changer for us, Dreamland Baby. Y'all have heard me talk about it because it was such a game changer for us. I talk about the time that Christian and I were watching Shark Tank and we were like having no sleep. Honey was a newborn and they were like, are you, you know, it felt like they literally were speaking right to us. Like, are you struggling with sleep at night? And we're like, yes, are we dreaming? And then they're like, Dreamland Baby, the wooded sleep sack. It was literally a a movie commercial moment and we ordered it immediately and it was such a game changer. We still use Dreamland to this day for Honey and Haven. Honey has a blanket from them. Haven has a sleep sack. It's amazing. One of Dreamland's awesome products is the weighted sleep sack, which we love and it mimics the feeling of a parent's touch using their exclusive cover calm technology to evenly distribute weight from shoulders to toes. It's such a game changer for your little ones to sleep, y'all. Truly, we notice such a difference. All Dreamland baby products are made with quality materials that are soft but also hold up after washing y'all we've like i said we've had these for a long time and we've continued to get new ones as well but they hold up really great they're also super easy to use with a tagless design and a two-way zipper for easy diaper changes which every parent out there you don't know you love two-way zippers till you got a two-way zipper and that is a gift so we have loved this this is like kind of the thing when we put them in their sleep sack it's like they know it's about time for bed and i love a routine like i love taking a bath before bed that's what kind of like gets me into like the nighttime zone and for them that is their moment like getting in the sleep sack is bedtime so go to dreamlandbabyco.com enter the code wo w-h-o-a at checkout you'll receive 20 percent off site-wide and free shipping my friends often ask me if i have a code for dreamland and i love whenever i do because these really are amazing this offer is for new and existing customers so if you've never got one before this is for you if you need a new one here is your chance. That's dreamlandbabyco.com. Enter the code WO, W-H-O-A, to receive 20% off site-wide and free shipping. Um, next one, how have you seen God remain true to his promises time and time again? Um, do you want me to go or do you want to go? You can go first. Uh, so I was going to say one thing, I think this is the most important thing, is to know what God's promises are. And say. there is a difference in what God's promises are and what our expectations of God's promises are. I think sometimes we say things like, you know, the promises of God, and we then, you know, fill in the gap for what we assume those promises will be, but they're not based in truth. So maybe we think he promises provision because you've heard someone in a church say that. Mm -hmm. 
But God's provision in the way that you might have heard it in a church context is not the kind of provision that when God says, I'm Jehovah Jireh, I'm, mm. I am the provider, what that actually looks like in your life. You know, like maybe someone's told you that his promises mean nothing bad's going to happen. Well, that's not true because there's a promise in scripture really from Jesus that in this world, you will face trials. You will face trouble. That's like a promise. But then there's another promise attached to that, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And so make sure that when you're meditating on the promises of God and you're trusting in the faithfulness of God and who he's promised to be, that you actually understand who he is and what he's promised. What he has promised and who he is is so much better than anything that you might have mustered up and thought he promised. You know, you might be looking at it from a standpoint of like, um, things all working out, but that's not necessarily true. Things might not work out. Life is crazy. You will have trouble. But in the end, do things work out? Yes, God will work all things together for good. That might not be like your version of good, but it will look like good when it comes to kingdom mindset. Uh, you know, so I do think that sometimes we get in trouble and we think God's not being faithful when it's not that God's not being faithful. God's being God. He's being who he is. He's just not being what you expected him to be. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure that your trust in God is trust in God for mm -hmm. who he is. So when you read scripture, like Psalms 91 is a great example. I mean, this, these are promises. These are beautiful. These are so good. I cling to them, but I also know that doesn't mean I'm not going to face trouble. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that hard things are not going to happen. And just because hard things happen doesn't mean God's not being God. He can be fully God and fully good even when things are hard. And he has promised us that. And so I have seen God time and time again be true to his promises. But sometimes that has been a wrestle, you know, to see. Um, that has been hard things to, to walk through, but I've seen his faithfulness in the midst of all the hard. And so, you know, don't, don't be all, God, you're not doing this, this, and this for me when God never said he would, you know, God mm -hmm. said he'd be there with you in it. God said, you know, even though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There's a promise that his rod and his staff will comfort you, but there's also a little, a little place in there that says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So, I just love that because it's like, that doesn't mean you're not going to walk through valleys of the shadow of death. That doesn't mean you're not going to walk through hard times. The promise is not that you won't endure hard things. The promise is that he will be with you in them and comfort you and walk with you. And so you don't have to be afraid, not because you won't walk through the shadow. You don't have to be afraid mm -hmm. because he is with you. So just make sure your promises and your expectations are really on what he's promised. That's so good. Either you read what I wrote or you're a mind reader. Because you stole a lot of the things that I was going to say. <laughs> well, I is, preached a message on this. You did, which is really sweet because we are one flesh. What you're listening to this, it just means if you marry, then you become one person. Wow, thank you for Whatever. explaining that. <laughs> that was not a question. Um, but thank you for not asking that question. <laughs> no, you stole, not stole, you said a lot of the things that I was going to say. But we've also been talking about this this week, and it says, no weapon formed against me, uh, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And I've been thinking about that because... It's, it, it's, it's almost like you will face many trials, right? It does not say you may face trials. And it says no weapon formed against you. So it doesn't say not a weapon will be formed against you. Like there may be a weapon formed against you, but it says they won't prosper, mm -hmm. right? So it's the prosper part. Not the not the weapon not part. the weapon and part, a lot right? of us want the weapon part to not be true. But. Yeah, but it's I think I think you I think you nailed it because it's we do you know almost like what we said earlier like write out what you feel like can be trigger points for you for stress and anxiety like go through scripture and write out what God's promises are and either do that and then maybe have like a little dash on the page and then write what you felt like mm -hmm. your expectations of God were and see what contradicts and maybe mm -hmm. what aligns but knowing God's promises is what can help you from being disappointed right yep. um so how have you seen God true to his promises or made true to his promises is by knowing what his promises are. Cause mm -hmm. I could say God hasn't been true if I don't know them, but they're, they're my expectations and he hasn't been meeting them. Um, but I think just looking through those things in scripture, you know, like you talked about, even though I walk through the valley, you will face many trials. No, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It's knowing what mm -hmm. the promises are and how they differ from what your expectations yeah. are. Because we all have expectations mm -hmm. of what, what we feel like God is, what he should do, what mm -hmm. he shouldn't do. And it's oftentimes when he doesn't meet that, mm -hmm. that's when we can get disappointed, we yeah. can get discouraged. And it's really mm -hmm. 
something that we've constructed in our mind and not actually what the Bible says is true. So Yeah. Hebrews 11 is like the hall of faith. And it's all these people who did super incredible things in the Bible. Um, But there's a, there's a verse in there that used to bother me. And it said, and all of these people um, didn't receive all that God had promised. And you're like, hold on, what? I mean, these people, these are the heroes of faith and they didn't receive all that God had promised. But then it says, for there is something better in mind. And it goes on to talk about heaven. And I love that because it's like all like all of the promises are not here. There's the promise of eternal life and the hope mm-hmm. of heaven and working all things together for good. It might not be on this side of earth. Like it might be in heaven that all of those things are finally complete and finally good when we're in his presence again. And so just knowing that just because you didn't see it now or when you thought you would, that doesn't mean that it's not to come. And I actually had um, a counselor do this with me one time where we were talking about fear and everything I was afraid of. And I mean, I just got in the nitty gritty of it. And she said, "Okay, Sadie, what if it happened? What if the worst of the worst happened? What if the worst thing that you're afraid of happened? Then what would be true? And I just love it because she was like, walk it out, walk it all the way out. And I got to the worst of the worst, you know, okay, like I die from this and this happens to my family, all the things. And she said, if the worst of the worst happens, God is God. If the worst of the worst happens, God is with you. If the worst of the worst happens and you die, you're in heaven with Jesus and God has your family and he loves your family and can take care of them better than you can. And I was like, facts, you know, like. That's promises. That Mm -hmm. is promises. Even if the worst happens, then God is still God. Even if the worst happens, then I'm with Jesus and God has my family. Like, and so it's so cool whenever you actually understand the promises of God and you look at the fears in your life because you're like, okay, truly the promises are always going to outrun the fears. The truth is always going to outlast the fear. And you know, the truth is in life, like every single person is going to die. <laughs> like that's, that's fact. That's mm-hmm. true. You know, and God is still faithful to his promises, even in all of that, because there is a hope of eternal life. And so it's just a good way of thinking about it. You know, I feel like that's kind of an extreme thing to say, yeah. but it's also like good to realize that even if like all the worst things happen in the world, you still have Jesus. And that is the beauty of the good news of the gospel, that there's eternal life. And if you don't have the good news of the gospel, now's a really good time to ask yourself, what do I believe? Like, what do I believe my life is for? What do I believe all this is about? Um, And if you don't have salvation in Christ, and I just lead you in this right now on the podcast, um, that this is what we believe, that God is a good, good father, that he created all things. And he sent his son Jesus to come and die on the cross to forgive us of our sins is the ultimate sacrifice. And we believe that he didn't just die and stay in the grave, but three days later, he rose from the grave, went back to heaven and invites us all to spread that good news, to find ourselves in that good news, to be washed in the blood of Christ, free from our sins, forgiven and be a new creation in him. And we believe that John 3, 16 says, uh, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So we believe that through our faith in Jesus Christ, His Son, uh, we get to have eternal life with the Father. That That's where we're going, is heaven. That's our home. And we also believe that the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, dwells within us. And so we're not walking out these days alone, that we have the Spirit that's empowered us. It's walking with us day by day. And so uh, that's where we put our faith, and that's why we can be confident to give these answers that we're giving y'all today. Um, so just wanted to lay that out really clearly, because some of you might be listening to this. You're like, this is really good advice, but if you don't have Jesus, then this advice probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And so dive into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, read the stories of God and um, of Jesus, and that'll be really helpful. Um, Last question is- Wrap it up really quick. A quick wrap up. How do you combat the loneliness that comes with being a new mom? And I just wanted to speak to this real quick because I saw you asked this question. And first of all, thank you for asking the question. I feel like a lot of moms feel that. I would say that, you know, people always say your life changes so much when you have kids. And yes, of course it does. But it changes in the best way. Like Mm -hmm. it changes in the best way when you have kids. And I will also say that it doesn't have to change in all the bad ways. Like I think that people are so afraid of their life changing in the way of, oh, I don't get to hang out with friends anymore. I don't get to travel. I don't get to do this. But who? You said you don't get to do that. You said you don't get to do that. Our kids love traveling. Our kids love when our friends come over. Honey, like 
loves all of our friends and we have our friends over all the time or we go to their house and we bring them with us and it's just so fun and so sweet it's actually been like it's made our life so much more fruitful so much more fun so i would just say don't isolate yourself you know don't let yourself become so lonely continue to have the friends that you have show up with your friends ask them if you can just bring the kids you know invite them over with the kids Mm -hmm. in the chaos in the mess our house is not really ever clean when friends come over it just is what it is and it's a little crazy and I'll walk away for you know 30 minutes to put Haven to bed and then honey will be out way too late and it's just part of it and we just have fun with it and so you know your life only has to change the the degree that you want it to and allow it to Um, it of course is going to change in all the other ways I believe for the better but in the ways that you're worried as far as friendships that you're going to lose or traveling, that's totally up to you. You know, you get to kind of, um, you get to dictate that weather in your house, if you will. You get to decide what you want it to be like. And we've decided to just invite people in even into the mess so that we're not lonely. And that's been super, super helpful. So I hope that helps you. Y'all, this was a great podcast. Thank y'all for even asking us thought provoking questions challenging us and our faith and our things. We loved it. So please keep asking questions, whether that be on YouTube, on Spotify, um, wherever you're listening. And then of course, DM us on social media on the What's Good podcast page. We love seeing what y'all are um, asking. And again, we always are up for hearing what guests y'all want to have on. It's so helpful for us, just scheduling wise, um, to think of who y'all want to hear from. And so just tell us, just let us know. And any feedback, encouragement always means a lot. So we love you guys and thank y'all so much. Thank y'all so much. Have a good Wednesday.